Let's first pay homage to the lineage gurus. Homage to the Venerable Mang Liao Ming, homage to Master Sakya Zhengkong, homage to His Holiness the Sixteen Kamapa, and homage to Master Dukdan Dorji. Homage to the main deity of Homa today, the Manuhara Vasudhara, the wealth attracting goddess. Simo Tanzangato Dutan City All Dhamma Masters, Dhamma Educators, Dhamma Teachers, Dhamma Lecturers, Dhamma Assistants, Rectors of Temples and Chapters all disciples present here and over the internet. Good afternoon, how do you do? I still shall I Ora Miko Take a much Ichiba Kimoji Jimmy Yabi Good afternoon. Happy New Year. Uh, I would like to announce for next Sunday, February 6th, Sunday, 3 p.m., there will be Tiger Head Vajra Homa Fire Offering Ceremony. And the Tiger Head Vajra is the wrathful emanation of Golden Mother. So, Tiger Head Vajra is the wrathful emanation of Golden Mother. And he's, uh, the Tiger Head Vajra is the auspicious item for this year, the year of the tiger, the Tiger Head Vajra. One of his her hands is holding the command banner, and the other one is holding a a gourd, like a calabash or a gourd that looks like a bottle. <laughs> So this is the image of Tiger Head Vajra. She can bring uh, wealth, health, and anything that you need. And this year, the year of the tiger, and the Tiger Head Vajra would be the most auspicious. If you don't want any auspiciousness in this year, then you don't need to become primary supplicant. <laughs> I, am, I am not forcing you to become primary supplicants, but if you don't want any auspiciousness, then you don't need to become primary supplicants. So what Grandma is saying is true. You don't need to force anything about anything. It will not be good. 
the mantra. The mantra. Om Jimu Siddhi Hom Hom Pe and the mudra. This is the tiger head. The head of the tiger. This mudra symbolizes the head of the tiger. That's for the tiger head vajra. And today we perform Manohara Lasudara. It was very clear in my overall merit dedication. She does not hook only wealth, she can also hook love and respect. And moreover, uh, she can hook away bad things and to attract good things, attract wealth and good fortune. And today it's raining. It's been a long time since it rained. And today it's raining. And water represents money or wealth. So that's called a spiritual response. One drop it's the same as 10 million. One brain drop, 10 million. So you can uh, hook wealth, health, and hook away all the sicknesses, and then attract uh, good health, and hook away calamities, and then for Bardo deliverance, it can also hook the Bardo spirits with affinity and Bardo spirits without affinity to be hooked to the Sukhawati. And you can hook uh, great fortune, whatever you need. So whatever you need, you can attract, and whatever you don't need, you can throw away using the Vajra hook. Very useful. And the key formula, you need to turn it three times. You need to turn the Vajra hook three times. So just now, I hook a pure gold, true gold covering all the ground and stack high gold bars. So pure gold bars stack very high. All gold all over covering the ground. So we hook the true gold, not uh, paper bills, because paper bills are still paper, but the real gold is uh, a proof and recognized all over the world. And also we attract all the precious items. So tomorrow is the Lunar New Year's Eve. And for the Southeast Asia to not today is the New Year's Eve. So Happy New Year. having a dialogue, he said, 
My wife maybe is on menopause. She's very forgetful. Uh, she's carrying a knife and yet looking for the knife all around the house. I really couldn't stand it. I can't stand her. And yet the man said, Oh, that's much better than mine. My wife is carrying knife and looking for me around the house. A grandpa came from the village to see the grandson in the city. And then the grandson took the grandpa to eat at the restaurant and on the wall there is a, a note that says free Wi-Fi. And so uh, the waiter asked, what would you like to order? And the grandpa said, oh, uh, I want the free one there, the Wi-Fi. The wife went to the prison to visit her husband. So, how are you doing? Are you suffering? And the wife, the husband replied, mm, Not so much. It's the same as at home. Not allowed me to go anywhere, cannot drink, and the food is as bad. Now we'll get to the main topic, the question and answer. From Sarawak, Malaysia, asked by Lian Hua Tian Mu. On February 28, 2016, at the Freedom Square in Taipei during the Mahotara Heruka Grand Ceremony, Grandmaster for the first time conferred the empowerment of Mahotara Hundred Peaceful and Wrathful Deities and Deliverance during Bardo through hearing the teachings. According to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, one will encounter the hundred deities at the moment of death. So, on top of the Mahotara mantra, should we also chant the mantras of the other hundred deities? Which grandmasters live a long life, or many Benihom? So the mantras of the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities. That was Mahotara mantra. That's the Mahotara Heruka mantra. But he asks, should we also chant the mantras of the hundred deities? Should I ask? Is there a common mantra for the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities? Of course, each one of them would have their own mantra. What sound was that? And maybe that's the common mantra. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard? 
The mantra for the hundred uh, peaceful and wrathful deities. Check the internet quick. I wanted to hear a song called The Girl by the Bridge, and immediately they found it and played it because I heard it once at the Rainbow Temple and I liked it. So I thought of it and they immediately could find it on the internet and play it. So the mantra of the 100 the Peaceful and Wrathful Deity. Is there? Is there this mantra on the internet? Wow, that's amazing. But I have no cell phones. Oh, so the heart mantra of the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities. That's called the common or general mantra. Om Ahom Bodhidharma Mahasukha Janata De A Om Zudo Zudo Hom Zo Hom Om Zudo Mm, it's incredible. Really, they have the mantra for hundred peaceful and rightful deities. There may be two mantras. One. Uh, let me consult if we should chant it or not. Wow, so you can search and find it on the internet. That's so convenient on the cell phone, and I don't even have one with me. So please let us know if we have to chant the mantra. Yes, you can chant it. Or not. So, either way, you can chant it or not. Because by chanting Mahotara Mantra, because, because inside Mahotara Heruka, they are hidden the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities. So Mahotara is the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities. So if you want to add the other mantra, it's okay too. But by just chanting the Mahotara mantra, which is what Grandmaster just chanted, it's fine too. It's the same as the the common mantra for all the hundred peaceful and rightful deities. Because inside the Mahotara Mandala or Pagoda, 
is are the hundred peaceful and restful deities. So Mahatara is the is the essence or the embodiment of all of them. So you can either chant both of them or just Mahatara is fine. Mahatara mantra is fine. And my gurus only taught me the mantra of Mahatara Heruka and not the other mantras for the hundred deities. So the answer is complete. So it's fine if you want to chant, you can add it or not. It's fine too. Question from Malaysia by Xiao Liu. Home is your grandmaster. In Tantric Buddhism, there are many methods of visualizations to multiply and transform into immeasurable merits, such as mantras for paying homage, for circumambulation to bless chanting beads, the thousand turns of the wheel, Dharma practice, as well as in the smoke offering and fire offering, there are also methods to transform into multiplicities. However, in my opinion, this do not quite matter because the key is in the generation of one's bodhicitta. Is that right? So he thinks they don't quite matter. Mantras for paying homage, circumambulation to bless chanting beads, the thousand turns of the wheel, smoke offering, fire offering. They are methods to transform or, or to multiply. But that doesn't matter because the key is in the generation of bodhicitta. Is that right? I would say yes. Because for any Dharma practice, you need to add the bodhicitta generation. When we look at the practice procedure, the first one, the one that I given to my guru, first is for full refuge, great homage, great offering, the four immeasurables, and what is, what are the four immeasurables? That's generation of bodhicitta. So, generating the four immeasurables is the same as generating bodhicitta. So, the guru taught us before the Dharma practice, we first perform the prostration, offering, fourfold refuge, four immeasurables, generate bodhicitta. Always this few things before, at the beginning. And one of them is generation of bodhicitta, which is very important. So for each of the Dharma practice, you need to generate bodhicitta. Because only by generating bodhicitta, you are bodhisattva. Without generating bodhicitta, then you have self, like stated in the Vajra Sutra. So generating bodhicitta is to help sentient beings. No self generating bodhicitta. It's the spirit of no self. That is right. To Malaysia, Xiaolu. Second question. I once heard a Dharma propagator say that by doing the thousand turns of the Dharma, the thousand turns of the wheel, Dharma practice, one can also multiply one's irrelevant thoughts, so he's discouraged its practice. I think we should not be afraid to practice any Dharma, whether it's good or bad. It depends on our own mindset, like the ghost witch who practiced Homa to do evil things, which was not the problem of the Homa itself. 
，大家修功德加倍的法门，密教跟一般的、so, 一般的佛教稍微有点。Tantrayana is somewhat different from other、uh, schools. Is here because you can in you can multiply it. You can、uh, enhance it because in Mahayana it was mentioned that to attain Buddhahood you need three great、uh, asamkaya kalpas. But in Tantrayana you can complete it in one lifetime because in Tantrayana you have the thousand turns of the wheel. So by practicing one time is the same as one thousand times. By chanting one mantra is the same as chanting a thousand times. So, so you multiply it, and you increase it over and over, and that's tantrayana, but not in Mahayana. If you make an offering, that's it. They don't visualize it to become. From one dot to become one plane, or to fill the whole dimensions, the whole cosmic space. That's how you do offering in Tantrayana. So you continue to multiply them. Therefore, spiritual cultivation in Tantrayana is faster. And that's the reason why. So a、uh, dharma propagator said that the thousand turns of the wheel can enhance your irrelevant thoughts because you don't have kind hearts, you don't generate bodhicitta. So, but it's said here, generation of bodhicitta is very important, and you multiply it. So, if you treat the, your irrelevant thoughts as the dharma, then of course they also multiply. So, good or bad depends on your mind. That's very important. So, if you learn and apply tantric practice to do evil things, then that would be bad. So your question is: thousand turns of that wheel is fine, or multiplying practices is fine, as long as your mind is pure and your mind is bodhicitta is fine. Third question. In completing our preliminary or fundamental practices, we should do it as a matter of factly. One is counted as one and not one thousand. Regardless of the multiplied merits, we should count one as one. After chanting one hundred thousand times or more, although the merit cannot be obtained. But on the mundane ground, one must continue to do good, because there is no such thing as attaining Buddhahood through evil deeds. This mad realization is it correct? Of course, there is no Buddhisattvas who do evil deeds. Of course, that is right. So when we count. Some people use some counters when they chant the Buddha's name. One is one, and don't think about the merits. But you still do the thousand turns of the wheel. That is okay, but you don't worry about the merits, and one is still counted as one. So Xiao Liu's、uh, opinion is right. I have always been practicing with the thousand turns of the wheel, 
and had never any problem ex with one exception. I helped perform Dhamma practice for those who died from forest fire in a certain country. Afterwards, I felt heat all over my body, although my temperature stayed normal. I often felt miserable and wanted to die, but at the same time, I clearly knew that those thoughts were not mine, and they did not affect my daily life. One week later, I still felt it, and I started to feel miserable and tired, so I did the Golden Mother practice of body replacement. Thereafter, I returned to normal. My question is, if I encounter a similar experience in the future, should I do Bardu deliverance, or transforming it as a means to enter meditation? If I do bardo, how much offerings do I need to prepare, or can I offer my wisdom chi in a fire and light drops as the best kind of offerings? So this is a deep question. He did dhamma practice for those who died from forest fire. And afterwards, he felt heat all over the body, and yet the body temperature stayed normal. I felt miserable and wanted to die. At the same time, I clearly knew that those thoughts were not mine and did not affect my life. And then a week later, I did the Golden Mother Body replacement practice. So you should have done it as soon as you feel miserable. You don't have to wait one week later. You should uh, do the Golden Mother's practice of body replacement right away. Or you can do the Golden Mother practice of body replacement immediately after you do the practice for those who died from the forest fire, which means you transfer the calamities to your Yidam or Golden Mother, and you let the cosmic space to handle it, to burden it, and because it's emptiness, so it's transformed into nothing. So if you encounter the same thing in the future, you should do the Golden Mother's practice of body replacement. That would be right. Because by doing Golden Mother's practice of body replacement, then you alleviate the replacement. You don't have to do Bardo deliverance. Because if you do Bardo deliverance, who knows, maybe many more would come. Or transforming it as a means to enter meditation. And it's better if you perform Golden Mother's body replacement practice first. And how much offerings do you need? Like if you do Bardo deliverance, there would be countless. Or should I offer the wisdom chi in the fire and light drops as the best kind of offering? Wisdom chi in the fire and light drops can be used as offerings. However, it is best uh, the one that can alleviate your uh, disaster is to do Golden Mother's practice of body replacement. See, because you are taking over the karma, so that's why, of course, body replacement would be best. So, Golden Mother is the mother sage, so anyone who has become a sage would go to the Golden Mother to uh, to report. <laughs> to check in, to register, to check in. I want to learn to swim because I heard swimming can 
make you lose weight. Uh, come on, don't be silly. Look at the whales. They swim 24 hours a day and have... Are they slim? There's a Zen master at the Mount Utai who took in a three-year-old novice as a little monk. So they practice in the mountains deep for over 10 years and never came out, never left the mountain. So the little monk did not recognize uh, the cows and the horses and the chickens and dogs. Uh, these are cows that can work, the horses can be ridden, the chicken can crow, call you to wake up, and the dogs can watch the house. And, and then there's a beautiful girl is walking by, and the little monk asks, so what animal is this? So the Zen master, in order to protect him, told him, this is called tiger. So if you're eaten by it, uh, you will not have anything left, not even your bones. So when they returned to the mountain, the Zen master asked, so of all that you've seen today at the foot of the mountain, are you still thinking of any of them? And then the young monk said, all I think about is that young, is that tiger, the human eating tiger. Confucian said that food, sex, uh, human nature. Even the young monk is that way too. So, but we shouldn't be afraid of the tiger. There's nothing to be scared of. <laughs> Just treat the tigers as the lizards, as in Chinese. It rhymes, they rhyme. Yeah, so the lizards, and you can learn to be like Wu Song, who specializes to beat the lizards. Lizards is like wall tigers, you know, in Chinese. Now, today we will talk on the Vajra Sutra. Subhuti, I recall during the countless Asamkhya Kalpas before Dipamkara Buddha, I made offerings and served 84,000 trillion Nayuta Buddhas without fail. In comparison, if there is a person in the Dharma ending era who can read, recite, and uphold the Sutra, his merits will exceed my merits from offering to all the Buddhas for more than a hundred times, a trillion times, or even beyond any measurement. Subhuti, there may be someone upon hearing my statement on the merits of a good man and good woman who recite and uphold the sutra in the Dharma ending era, who would become utterly confused, suspicious, and in disbelief. Subhuti, know that the meaning of the sutra is inconceivable, and its reward is also inconceivable. This was spoken by Sakyamuni Buddha. Subhuti, every time the Buddha was giving Dharma teachings, uh, whichever disciple asked him question, he would call on the disciple's name. 
he recalled during a countless Ashamka Kalpas before Dibamkara Buddha or the Burning Light Buddha, I made offerings and served 84,000 trillion Nayuta Buddhas. That's 10 to the 140th still. That's uncountable. So, made offerings and served all these Buddhas without fail. So that they would be satisfied, never miss a Buddha. In comparison, if there is a person in the Dharma ending era who can read, recite, and uphold the Sutra, his merits will exceed my merits from offering to all the Buddhas for more than a hundred times. A trillion times, or even beyond any measure. So this is the comparison spoken by Sakyamuni Buddha. So offerings to infinite Buddhas compared to reads, reading, reciting, and upholding the Vajra Sutra. So the comparison of the two. So Sakyamuni Buddha had made offerings to infinite Buddhas, and in the later era, there is a person who can uphold and recite the Vajra Sutra and the marriage of each of them were compared. So it's like 1%. So offerings to infinite Buddhas Law is only uh, is less than the one who can uphold and recite the Vajra Sutra, but the key is in the upholding, as I have said before. Why? Because you do have merits by offering to Buddhas, but you can count it. But upholding the Vajra Sutra, it's impossible to count or measure them. Measure the merits. And pay attention. There is a comparison here. Sakyamuni Buddha in his past lives have made offerings to many, many Buddhas, all Buddhas, never missing one. He offered to all the Buddhas. And I uphold the Vajra Sutra, read and recite the Vajra Sutra. And comparing the two, the issue here is in the comparison. In this world, uh, here, there is a uh, meaning hidden in it. Very few people will ever mention it. See? But let me tell you, please don't compare. Grandmaster Lu says, do not compare for Chinese words. By all means, never compare. Why do you want to compare? Because comparison is the source of all afflictions. Because once you compare, there would be self. 
because only when you have self, you would compare. If you have no self, whom would you compare with? So, uh, what's the meaning of Vajra Sutra? It's mentioned here. Sakyamuni Buddha made offerings to 84,000 trillion Nayuta Buddhas, made offerings and served, and never missing any Buddha. Compared to the one who uphold and recite the Sutra, his merits compared to my merits is more than a hundred times, a trillion times, or even beyond any measurement. So Sakyamuni Buddha was talking about comparison. I'm not telling Sakyamuni Buddha, but I'm telling you do not compare. How can you compare? And comparing is the source of afflictions. Uh, you leave the house today and you see a beautiful girl and then you get home and see your own wife. And then you would uh, smash the, uh, the glasses and then you would uh, throw your antiques, but not antiques, the expensive, just throw something cheap. Why? Someone is so beautiful, but why is my wife like this? Then you would feel upset. You cannot compare. So afflictions come from comparing. So behind our Seattle Lejang Temple is Microsoft Corporation, which is getting bigger and bigger. It bought all the lands around it. When I pass by it, before we even built the Seattle Lejang Temple, I have said it that whoever bought this piece of land would become the richest man in the world. It has a good geomancy, geomancy. It's a land belonging to the richest man in the world. Uh, we are down the hill, but up the hill is Microsoft. And if you're comparing to Bill Gates, <laughs> it would be comparing that's that second one to the chicken drum stick. How can you compare? For him, he would just spend trillions or billions of dollars for his charity. So when he found Africa to be poor, he donated billion a billion of dollars to raise chicken there. He did not know that the chickens came from Africa. But whenever he spent, he would spend billions of them, billion dollars of them. And our Sung Yen Lu Foundation has spent, I don't know how much money by now. Perhaps a few million dollars. But for him, it's like hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. How can we compare? How can we compare? Whenever they uh, give, that's billions, but for us it's just million. How can you compare? If you compare, you would be so upset. 
You can't compare with others. Like True Buddha School, comparing to Ji Foundation, just the last digit of the amount of money they have compared to to the school is even it's more than to the school how can we compare with the fo guang sun their temples are so big and ours are so small the monasteries that they built in any countries in south africa they also built a temple there and the Fo Guang San Temple at Da Su, Pingtung, Kaohsiung, the whole mountain there. So humongous, it's impossible to compare. As soon as you compare, uh, you would be upset, miserable. And look at the Zhong Tai Zen Temple. They, if you visit there, you would see many antiques there. And even just one antique, we can't compare. And if you go to the Huaku Sun, they have a huge uh, bell. And every and during the new year, all everybody, including the presidents and vice presidents, they would go there to to uh, strike the bells. Yeah, but we don't have such a big bell. But this is our bell. We only have this Vajra bell. They have huge bell, and. It requires many people to pull it and then to strike it with that. We cannot compare. How can you compare with Huakusan, the Flower Dra Mountain? How can you compare with Suzi Foundation? How can you compare with Zhong Tai San? How can you compare with Fo Guang San? You should not compare. This is what I like to emphasize. You cannot compare. Comparing is a source of affliction. The Vajra Sutra talks about the meaning of emptiness. The bell is empty. The temples are empty. Money is empty. The antiques are empty. If you use the emptiness to embrace, then you embrace everything. So, making offerings and serve the infinite Buddha is still lost to upholding and deciding the Vajra Sutra. So, if you can uphold and decide the Vajra Sutra, then you are empty. Then the emptiness embrace or include myriad things in the universe, everything, basically. So the Vajra Sutra, if you have comprehended it, that your mind can generate myriad dharma, which means can generate anything and everything. So Sakyamuni Buddha here talk about a comparison. He was making offerings and served the infinite Buddhas and his merit or he still lost to the one who could uphold and decide the Vajra Sutra. The merit of the person who could uphold and decide the Vajra Sutra. Why? You should understand this concept because the Vajra Sutra is emptiness, and emptiness can give rise to all things. Everything comes from emptiness. The earth, water, fire, and wind, 
the four elements all comes from emptiness or void. So the five elements, earth, water, fire, wind, and space or emptiness. Emptiness is the last one, but emptiness can embrace everything, can embrace the earth, water, fire, and wind. So Grandmaster also have done a comparison. And Sakyamuni Buddha did a comparison too, but let me tell you that comparing is the source of all afflictions. So whatever you encounter, never compare. So you drive a car, an expensive and renowned car. My car is Maserati. Uh, it's a kind of sports car made in Italy. And then you encounter Lamborghini and Ferrari and they are more expensive than Maserati, right? And then... <laughs> and then you feel unhappy, you're upset. And if you encounter a Japanese car, Honda, Infinity, or Suzuki, Hmm? A spa? And then you would feel like, hmm, my Maserati is better. And when someone say, good car, oh, oh you are happy. And Someone's driving Lamborghini just uh, just passes by you, then you would mm, that's a small comparison. As soon as you compare, then you would be afflicted whether you would be happy or upset. So we should know never to compare. And Sakyamuni Buddha, in order to explain the Vajra Sutra, he did comparison. And Grandmaster Lu, in order to explain this excerpt of the Sutra, I also did some comparison. But let me tell you, never compare. Because the Vajra Sutra stated, non-phenomena of self, when there's no self, how can there be any comparison or comparing non-phenomena of others? When there's no self, there's no others. So who is comparing with whom? Non-phenomena of sentient beings. There are no sentient beings. Whom are you comparing with? Non-phenomena of lifespan. No time. Nothing to compare. I often give this example. On the moon, that's basically non-phenomena of self, non-phenomena of others, non-phenomena of sentient beings, and non-phenomena of lifespan. Who would be comparing with whom on the moon? What is good? What is bad? What is Buddha Dharma? What is animal products? What is plant products? None. All of them are inside nothingness. So sometimes, if you do not compare, you would be at peace and at ease. And you uphold and recite the Vajra Sutra. And you comprehend the meanings and from then on, you comprehend emptiness. You, uh, you realize, you understand emptiness, and that is enlightenment. 
But if you actualize and realize this emptiness, then you would become a sage. That would be the greatest, because you have no more afflictions, no merits, no afflictions, no merits, no more attachments. What are you being attached to? No more attachments. And those are the small potatoes, like your moods, your emotions. You're not comparing, so what, what emotions would you have? But as soon as you compare, you would start to feel some emotions, some mood swings, you know, for human beings. And then, if you have no self, how can you have any habitual tendencies? They are the same as nothing, gone. So you can eradicate all this. And when you amiss emptiness, you embrace everything. That's the essential meaning of the Vajra Sutra. That's all for today. Omani Bemi Home.